With an impossibly thin proprietary coating, XS maximizes string life, repels corrosive elements, and projects a rich, lasting tone. XS, the coated string that safeguards your sound. Chris Keys for from your guitar, I'm joined today by Oliver Wood of the Wood Brothers. But today we're going to talk kind of about the Wood Brothers setup, but also about uh, your new solo record, Always Smiling. That's going to be out in a couple weeks here. Yes, sir. Well, let's talk right about this guild. I know, it's, like I said, Wood Brothers probably most fans identify you with this '60s guild. Yep. Tell us the tale of it. So uh, I've had this guild since the mid '90s, and um, and in the early '90s, um, I was one of millions of people who, ha who had strats and played strats and who loved Steve Ray Vaughan and Hendrix and as we should they're all amazing and the strat is an amazing guitar but I felt kind of lost in the the shuffle of the strat sound and look and everything and um, so I just remember feeling like I gotta go a different direction and I um, at the time had a few students at this one store, uh, store in Atlanta when I was living there at a music store and it's, this guitar came through and I just kind of fell in love with it. I could hear the somehow the woodiness of it, you know, uh -huh. and I'd like to hollow. I liked it, you know, if I wasn't careful, it would feed back. And I was at the time playing through a big uh, Fender uh, Super, which, which uh, that with this was a dangerous combo. Like it, could <laughs> it could get away from you. And I actually, I used to... Uh, stuff it with, I had all these old tidy whities <laughs> with underwear. I wish they were in here, it'd be a better story if they but they had all these old Fruit of the Looms and BVDs and stuff, and they were all stuffed in there, and I just had it just right, so I could feed back just as much as or little as I wanted to. But there would always be a little bit of a, like, a Fruit of the Loom waistband sticking out or something, and people always go, is that, you know. It's a conversation starter. Even more interesting than the music, yeah. <laughs> all right, Oliver, I don't want to get too far into the bedroom talk, but have you, did you mess around before landing on the tidy whities Did you mess around with other types of fabric or were you always kind of looking for like something more dense and cotton? No, it had to be, <laughs> had to be the, the sound of cotton. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, um, yeah, that was my tone. But I, I was on a show called Live From Here one time and um, the Chris Thiele show and it was in a big theater with a live radio audience. Mm -hmm. And my, I was not getting a signal and I was freaking out, and the, they had a local tech guy who just put it on his bench, and he started yanking out. I was like, no! That was like 20 <laughs> years of, of uh, cotton. <laughs> and, um, and I didn't know what else was going to come loose with it yeah. or whatever. So, um, so anyway, I lost my tidy whities He fixed it, put this piece of foam in, and I just didn't want to touch it since. But I do, uh, I feel pretty sentimental about the old tidy whitey thing. But <laughs> I, I, trying to convince myself the sound is in my fingers. Yeah. Now, what about strings and tuning that typically use with this guild, whether it's for the new record or for Wood Brothers? Um, so, uh, the, I use DR strings, I okay. use 11s, and um, I've been using DR for a long time. They, they've been really good to me over the years. And, um, and these are 11s. I usually put 11s on my, my electrics. Okay. And, um, the one, uh, and you asked about tuning. Yeah. Uh, so I'm usually standard. Um, however, I'll get a slide real quick. 
Um, you don't you have like a half G? I have a half G tuning, which I think some people call it, where I just tune the first first string down okay. only. Um, so that basically gives me this. You know, the, the like you would the first four strings of a G. Mm -hmm. But it also lets me play chords. So a lot of times. You know, I can still play a bar chord like that or a. I have songs like, um, I have uh, I would rather song called One More Day. Which is in G, and it has a four chord and a five chord. And I can still play those, since I haven't messed up the rest of my yeah. tuning, I can still get to those chords. Mm -hmm. So that's the idea of the half G as opposed to going all the way open. Is that it's mostly like what I'm used to, so I can still play an E if I'm careful. bar chords. I use my thumb a lot, so I get some cool sounds out of that, like um, it kind of makes a, a, a seventh chord happen automatically when you just play a regular G chord. Now, was that like a happy accident, or yeah. is that okay? Is happy that accident. I was like, I was like, how can I, um, you know? play a little more slide and I was always um, in a trio rhythm section like before um, the Wood Brothers I was in a band called King Johnson I was the only guy playing chords or it, it was just horns and drums and mm -hmm. bass so um, so I wanted to be able to play, play I didn't want to change tunings every song I just wanted to be able to play mostly what I normally play but be able to play some proper slide licks um, so it worked out. Yeah. yeah. And uh, before we move on to any of these other treasures around you, I think it's really important to identify that these are the original DMR and DM, DR Mahand pickups. Yeah, these they are the original uh, Gucci pickups. <laughs> um, yeah, the, the, um, actually, the Armand makes these pickups, and I looked it up once in this Guild book. God, I should have cleaned this thing before you guys came over. It's disgusting. It's uh, just mojo. It's mojo. You could call it that. <laughs> um, but yeah, these pickups in the in the old catalog, they called them Mickey Mouse pickups because they're so cheapo. I think. I mean, that's. I don't know why else they'd call them Mickey Mouse yeah. pickups. But I think just because they they don't look like Mickey Mouse, maybe they sound kind of cheap. But that's kind of the charm of it. Is yeah. like that said, like, like you're saying before, you're kind of trying to get away from the strat. A absolutely. Absolutely. So yeah, just not having that out of phase strat sound. Um, if anything, a little more telly like. Although, um, I don't know. I found that over the years, I'm like, I think it sounds. It's got its own thing. Yeah, it kind of. It. I've heard you kind of make it go fendery, but I've also heard it like real treble, ice picky. Yeah. Freddie King sting. Yeah, that's the uh, that back pickup is very. <laughs> kind of not all night long because it'll drive you it'll hurt after a while but <laughs> yeah. the ice pick is a good yeah is a good way but it also has sort of a warmer like um, almost like front strat um, you know it has that sound too from the front pickup so um, it can be sort of warm and friendly too I think it's probably because I'm sitting right in front of the F holes here, but it, it still retains, no matter what you're doing to it or changing it, it still has a real resonant woody tone to it. Yeah, that's what it feels like. Yeah, that's like it it's like. it's real barking at me. Yeah. And and so with the new record coming out, how much did this, I know that this is a live instrument for you and obviously studio tool, yeah. but how much of that is, the, how much of this is on Always Smiling? Oh, plenty. Um, Plenty, although a lot, I, I, a lot more variety on the album than I would do live, or than I would be able to do, mm -hmm. to do live. Um, but it's definitely on there. Like it's, uh, there's a song called Molasses where I play a sort of an epic slide yeah. solo, and it's it's champ. It's totally champ in this and a delay pedal. And what about Face pedal. of Reason? That has another slide uh, part in it. Face of Reason, that that one too. Okay. Yeah. 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 So those. Um, 
I definitely love it for um, for just my most basic sounds. And once in a while, like I'll turn to the uh, to this weird holiday. Or I mean, I even did some things where I took this weird uh, Epiphone and plugged it into the board. Direct. <laughs> Direct. <laughs> it just because you know, so much of of experimenting um, is just trying things that. Don't do that. You know that's going to sound horrible. I'm like, well, I'm going to try it because no one else is doing it. Now. Yeah. You know, and that was kind of the same idea for getting this guitar. It's just like well, I don't see anybody else with one of these. Let me try it. Never know. I should have mentioned at the beginning. We're in this beautiful space, and it's actually yeah. you guys has joined. Uh, I know you have a friend in town that you guys kind of co-opted this space, and it's so you're yeah. in a studio, so you're able to have the luxury to experiment. Absolutely. Do the I, wrong I things. Yeah. And that's <laughs> not so, that is a luxury I don't take for granted. Like we have our own studio space now that allows us to really experiment and just try the, the, the weirdest things. So when I say weird, I just mean weird in terms of guitar and what, you know, I like, I really like, you know, I've got a Princeton and I've got a Blues Junior and I've got things like that, but these are sort of the more interesting things that, that uh, especially when you're in the studio, can be really fun. Well, we'll get inspiring. to those. I, I think we need to, now that you kind of touched on it, you alluded yeah. to it, let's, let's meet the holiday here. Okay, let's meet holiday. This one is uh, the, the holiday. This is this is actually a Harmony Bobcat holiday version. Um, and uh, where did you get this one? I got this one at Fanny's House of Music oh, here in, in town. Nashville. Yeah. And of course, fell in love with these pickups. And uh, it came with the. This is not the original um, uh, pickguard. Uh, or knobs or switch. It came with a um, similar shape pickguard with all these switches right here. So you had every possible combo. And I just kept hitting them. Mm -hmm. I otherwise loved it. But um, so I had the folks at Carter Vintage um, redo this. And uh, and I got a three three way switch in here because I don't need these to be together at all. So I like them kind of one at a time. Okay. So we have. <laughs> Got the, the darker front pickup, the uh, and, and then some of the twangy. You know, I like that a lot. to sound a little cheap. Would you say that like the the bridge pickup is kind of like the money spot for you in terms of like uh, where you're gonna live most of the time? Um, it, it, with a sort of dirty sound like this, uh -huh. yes. Okay. Um, and you know we can go through the amps uh, later but with the dirtiest sound probably so although I love the middle. The middle like at a lower volume uh, I don't know somehow really works for a lot of things. It feels really sweet. spot on the late last uh, Wood Brothers record, the Don't Think About My Death. Now, d did it make a spotlight in, in Always Smiling as people bond with that record in the future? I can't remember now, to be Putting honest. Putting you on the spot. Yeah, I, I was trying to remember when I was taking this out, did this actually get on the record? Um, I don't think, I maybe didn't. I've been playing it live lately because I have a song on the record called The Battle Is Over, mm. um, which is the one that I actually recorded with this guitar plugged into the board. Oh, okay. Which was really, and we were playing in, uh, through this tiny little four track tape machine in there, just the basic track. So it really hit the tape and smushed it and was just amazing as it stood. But to try to recreate that, I've been using this, uh, this guitar um, for that. Uh, <laughs> Um, that sort of twang on the low end like that. And even. But then also just the rhythm part. So, anyway. I often 
and tune it down a whole step, um, which I really like it when it gets, because you know, this is a smaller scale, so mm -hmm. when you tune it down, even when you don't tune it down, it's a little more spaghetti-like, and the, the, the intonation is a little weird, and the strings are a little wonky, so you go extreme, tune it down a whole step, and then you're, you got even more of what it does. You know? Yeah, it brings out a lot more of its charm. Yeah. Who should we meet next over here? Uh, well, let's see. So next up, this is um, a guitar that I've had for a good uh, 12 years or something like that now. Um, I actually found it at a guitar center, believe it or not, and hanging wow. in their used guitar room and, and loved it. It's an old 50s um, Gibson CF100. I think uh, I read that it was the first cutaway ever um, ever tried, I think, um, on an acoustic guitar, um, at least by Gibson. And uh, I was in the 50s, and it's not the most uh, desirable uh, collector thing or anything, but it is an old, small body Gibson. So, yeah, it's um, got that so cutaway like you're so saying. So it's got what I like. Yeah. So like, I will play this through a little Grace Audio preamp, and okay. it goes into the PA like that. So. Um, in the studio, I don't use it so much. And what is the pickup on here that you do um, use for live? So it's a combo. I have two pickups. Okay. I have the K and K. I guess it's a pure mini. I think it's called, which is the the under saddle pickup um, on the inside, um, transducer style. And this is the magnetic pickup, a Sunrise. And, and uh, I think I mostly just use the the K and K for most of the sound. And you know, it's so hard to get a good acoustic sound. Uh, with a pickup, yeah, I never love it, but um, I think it's the best we can do with a, you know, in a large venue when you just there's no way you can like it. It's a compromising situation because it's like you 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 want it to be amplified, but then you're having to deal with what as things don't sound what you hear or were represented yeah. on a record. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I've gotten into at least in the studio, you know, oftentimes not worrying does it it doesn't have to sound just like the instrument necessarily as long as it sounds cool. Mm -hmm. So. Um, but this is the toughest one, I think, you know, playing in a uh, Red Rocks or something, and you're just strumming chords, it's not gonna, it's not gonna sound like a real guitar. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Now, is, when you saw it on the wall, did it have the pickup in it, or is that something you completely added? Um, I added that. Okay. Yeah, I added that. I just bought it purely uh, with nothing in it, and then I added the electronics. So. Yeah, and it's, it's been beat to heck. It's been uh, repaired yeah. lots of times, obviously. It's got cracks, repaired cracks that go all around it. I've had it patched up a couple times, and um, I've taken it all over the world. So it's 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 get to work out. I was gonna say it's a true ro uh, road warrior. It's a road warrior, yeah. So um, so we got that. All right. Um, and then for studio instruments, um, this guitar is something that I used, like I said, in the studio for the album. I used this quite a bit. I used it on uh, my single, which is called Fine Line. For little things like that, it's kind of this weird mid-rangey, has a very small neck. Um, it's plugged in, it's like, eh, it doesn't sound amazing, but acoustically uh, miking it right it's not very loud it sounds it sounds cool though. yeah I was gonna ask how did you mic it was it something kind of um, like you kind of mic these F holes somewhere mm -hmm. sweet um, so you got tape here yeah all kinds of that's tape from the pickup that's under the saddle that that uh, I don't even know what kind of pickup it is but it's not the greatest mm. but uh, but anyway I, this has a lot of sentimental value to, to it I bought this from a friend of mine um, named Sean Costello, and I don't know if you guys know who Sean Costello is, but for anybody who doesn't, you should look him up. Uh, amazing blues guitar player uh, from Atlanta, where I came up playing. And he was quite a bit younger than me, but, but uh, an amazing player, um, sadly passed away uh, when he was 30. Wow. Um, but Sean Costello, you gotta look him up. And this is one of his old guitars. I uh, bought it from him while he was still alive. And, uh, Anyway, it's got the sentimental. He was a buddy and, a, and an influence. I think we're we're uh, guitar nerd buddies, so. <laughs> kindred spirits. Yeah, and it's uh, cool. we get to carry so it on. he recorded with it too. It's on some of his records. And uh, uh, anyway, 
check out Sean Costello for sure. It's cool that you get to keep living on the legacy of music with your friend through this instrument that you yes. guys shared. Yeah, exactly. And I've, I've been lucky that way with a lot of things where uh, I have several things that were given to me and I think that over the years musicians just, uh, uh, I don't know, that's one way to show the love. Just, hey, I, want, I found this amp, I want you to have it. I know yeah. you like little amps or something, you know. Um, so I actually have a, a cool, another guitar here that was a gift. I, I'm a little scared to take it on tour and it doesn't have a pickup in it or anything. But this is a 60s, excuse me, 37. Um, Gibson L00. So, um, I just love small body. Uh, acoustic guitars, and um, this one's got the. We were talking about. <laughs> yeah, it's got, we were. <laughs> it's got the smell, and I'm not. I'm not too proud to say I sniff my guitars, and I. And when I'm buying a guitar, I'm not, you know, I'm at the store, you look around, you're like, you, <laughs> you got a free this, moment. It's got to have that, <laughs> that musty smell. You said it had to do with the old glue, right? Yeah. So I don't know what it is, but. Um, so. Um, I'm not, I won't say who gave this guitar to me, but it was somebody awesome, and um, he has one just like it or similar, and, and um, we were on tour together, and he let me play his, and I kept back coming back every day and said, man, let me play that thing again. <laughs> and then at the end of the tour, he, he walked me in his bus and just said, hey, this is for you, and he, and he got me my own. He had a guy. Who, he was tired of you borrowing his. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so um, anyway, really... Uh, amazing uh, not only is a guitar amazing but again the, the sentimental you know it's a it's a uh, symbol of of a real deep friendship so do you record with this one then absolutely okay absolutely um I'll, I'll tell you an interesting thing i discovered with this one too uh that's a little bit interesting is i started in this well i'll, I'll get to another uh another guitar afterwards but got interested in having less sustain. And so, so I started messing around with this. I think my wife gave me this, it's a wooden slide. Yeah. So it's not only that, but it's got a big crack in it. Yeah. So, uh, so it's almost like the slide is louder than even the notes, <laughs> uh, but uh, something about it, It feels a little ridiculous right now in front of you guys playing it, but <laughs> I got a uh, one of the songs on the album. My album is called um, "Unbearable Heart," and that's what that's what I did. I played this with this, and you know, with a really nice mic, and it really just captured that weirdness a little bit. What got you fascinated? Because a lot of times guitarists get fixated on sustain. What made you kind of go down, take a left uh, turn? Well, again, it was sort of that that opposite thinking. It's like um, you know, what if you did exactly the opposite of what everyone else was doing, or, or what seems like the logical thing? So yeah. it's like that counterintuitive kind of thing. Okay. Um, and because what's cool about it is it still has the untempered, you know, the, if there's no fret involved, so it's like microtonal. Yeah. And. So it has the slide vibe, but um, it makes you play different. And what, what I've found as a writer, as, as um, you know, a creative person, is like sometimes you need to get out of your box. You need to be inspired by something mm. you haven't heard yet. And so, because uh, if you just play your same old guitar through the same old rig with the same old tuning, uh, 
you just tend to do the same old, have the same old ideas. So yeah. sometimes just doing something weird like this um, gives you a different kind of inspiration and takes you out of your normal box and puts you in that zone of cre creating stuff, you know, and then different kinds of lyrics come and different kinds of arrangements and, you know, you just get somewhere creatively that you might not have otherwise. I mean, you know, we're creatures of routine, so we almost have to like, yeah, force ourselves out of that to, yeah. to kind of get something somewhere new. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So sometimes, and, and I talk about this with songwriters all the time, is sometimes I think what we all find is that w we create best if if we can create a situation like that, like borrow someone else's guitar or tune your guitar in a new tuning or go to the piano even if you're not a piano player or pick an a weird instrument or something like that. And sometimes that w that's what gets you uh, inspired in, in a different way. Right? Yeah. All right, Oliver, before we, m we're going to end on another pairing of a guitar and amp, but it's worth noting the amps we've been hearing so far. But before we do that, I actually know that you use the capel in a kind of unusual way with this guitar. I, I know that you really sometimes will put it up on like the seventh. Oh, or the ninth. capo. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So maybe demo that quick for us. Yep. I'll use the capo. Yep. Because normally I, I throw mine on the first or second or third fret. I, I don't, yeah, I, I like, um, I got really into this uh, Afri African guitar video that my brother gave me. And, uh, and a lot of the guys, my favorite one, his name is Daniel Kachamba, um, who I borrowed a lick from here. Yeah, things like that that are sort of African influence, but my own sort of bastardized version of it. Yeah, whole um, different register. Yeah, so that's kind of neat. Yeah, so it's kind of cool up there. Um, Anyway, yeah, the capo's cool. Um, sometimes the um, I usually try to mix it up, but uh, or blend. But I really like the small amps. I really like the Champ um, for the sort of fendery. to be just a little too dirty mm -hmm. for, even for something like that um, so that's the um, that's the Fender Champ 60s Champ and you got the tremolo running on that I do have a tremolo running just a regular old boss tremolo yeah and then um, sorry what, you, what I was just going to say just so people knew that uh, when you were in your tidy whitey days you were running that with the super reverb where now you made exactly the, you made the move to the smaller amps. yeah yeah so live, I usually run uh, two amps in, uh, together and let the sound man blend them. And it's always this little K, okay. four watt amp, plus usually a little bit larger amp, like a Princeton size amp. Blues Junior, I, I often use a Blues Junior as a second amp just because when I do fly dates and you go to a festival, you have to use whatever back line they're gonna give you, whatever amps they have supply, mm -hmm. and they always have Blues Junior. So I figured if I got to know the Blues Junior, as a modern amp, that's what I'm going to be stuck with a lot. So, yeah. So, and it's not a bad amp. It's a great amp. It's just not as like quirky and, and it's way more reliable than some <laughs> of these amps. So, so. Um, but anyway, in the studio, I'd rather use a Champ and get a little more of an, um, of not not a less modern sound. So. Okay. Um, but what's cool about this little K is a, it was like two hundred dollars. <laughs> great. On eBay. Uh, and two, you can put it on the I in the overhead compartment of a airplane, so I can get my sound, you know, at a festival. Just put that with the Blues Junior, um, and and I'll play you that one by itself. It's it's uh, deceptively large for a little amp.
got that. Um, it's got the ice picky. You know, that kind of sound. Um, might get a little muddy if it was the only amp I had, but yeah. I have done, like when we started the Wood Brothers, my brother played upright bass and I would play just that amp, just as a duo. And if I turn it down a little bit, it cleans up and it sounds pretty nice. But then if I crank it, it's got that. So. I could see in, how, in a recording session that could be mic'd and made to sound a lot bigger it's, than it is. It can sound huge. What, four watts? Uh, four watts. Yeah. And, and you add a little, uh, you know, boost and distortion and you have pretty... So it's pretty, it's pretty giant for such a little guy. Yeah. Yeah. And is it, uh, I'm guessing, an 8-inch speaker, or is it even oh, smaller no, than it's that? A, I think it's a 7-inch, Okay, which is pretty unusual, yeah. Yeah. Cool, and prior to this kind of amp discussion, everyone was kind of hearing both amps at the same time. Correct, correct. Okay. So we were hearing a blend, which, you know, yeah, we can talk about that. There might be a sweet spot where you get a little bit of tremolo from the big amp, from the big champ. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but that, you know, generally the, the, the little amp tends to get overpowered. And, and incidentally, you know, we always put a, a, a condenser on the, on the little thing, so it really does get the full spectrum of its bottom end. Okay. It has a remarkable amount of bottom end, so. All right, Oliver, this is a distinct pair that you have set up for us to conclude on. So tell us about that. Uh, we'll start with the instrument first. Uh, so the instrument is an old uh, Stella from the 30s. I found it in, um, in a used music shop in Augusta, Georgia, while I was on tour. And I got inspired because um, a friend of mine had something similar that had been modified. So I sent it to a guy named Reuben Cox in L.A. who does this cool mod where he finds an old Tysco pickup, which, uh, in spite of that buzz, is a relatively quiet pickup for an old vintage pickup. Mm -hmm. uh, and what's unique about the new setup here is that this bridge has rubber around it. So it's a rubber bridge, um, and it is got flat wound strings on it, so it's, it's kind of as dark and dead as you can get. So it, it, there's very little sustain, and um, it, acoustically, it sounds like. Almost like a dead classical guitar or uh -huh. something. Now, this is a little shocking, but. <laughs> and um, you know we may have talked about this earlier but sometimes that's that weird sound that is the like the wooden slide conversation um, of less sustain and um, something quirky um, is the is what ends up being inspiring so I use this a lot on the last Wood Brothers al album it's called Kingdom Kingdom in my mind um, and I used it a lot on this new uh, my new solo record as well now, so. to, to elaborate on what Ruben does, it not only just the pickup, but he, he like kind of rehouses or like resets the bracing, right? Too. It's, yeah, it's so an internal thing as well. Well, it is. It's, I think he, first of all, just makes it a really good playing guitar. Because mm -hmm. when I bought it, it needed work. So that's, you know, he's a luthier first, and I think he really knows how to uh, reset the neck and all that stuff. Uh, but then he puts his own touch, which is, yeah, which the trademark. is these things. Yeah, the uh trademark. -huh. Yeah. And you know that's not all he does. He does all kinds of stuff. I'm told, but um, but so you can you can hear how uh, um, how it like if I'm using a um, you know I put a little bit of just dirt on it and Um, 
But uh, I'll tell you what I really like is um, playing slide on it. And I haven't really tried the wooden slide on it. That would be like exponentially dead. <laughs> but um, just... Uh, That it, you know, it'll take off. Just need some tidy whities It just needs, yeah, just the right <laughs> amount of tidy whities so. so anyway, um, I, it's so funny talking about this guitar, and it, it seems almost like a joke. Like, is he? I mean, I just wonder, like, if, if you're really into something completely different, this is ridiculous. But I love it. So makes me, it makes me write different. So sorry. Well, as I say, sometimes uh, ridiculous is remarkable. You know? Yeah. It can turn a, turn on a dime. Yeah. But we should note, because this is not the two amps that we've been hearing to make this magic happen, is this Epiphone, yeah, right? Yeah, in the, in the studio, it was this Epiphone. This is an Epiphone Pathfinder, uh, also from the 60s. And uh, if, I if I'm not mistaken, it's basically the same thing as a Gibson, maybe Falcon, or there, there's a Gibson... Um, Maybe like a Skylark is another one, I yeah, think. Yeah, it's one of those in the same, you know, it's, it's kind of like uh, the size of a, a Princeton in terms of, of wattage and stuff. So, um, yeah, so it's a very Gibson-like amp. and has great built-in tremolo, yep. which I, I love. And um, it's, it's, just, it's pretty good with this guitar, at least recording-wise. Yeah, how did you come, yeah. come to make this marriage? Because like you said, this is kind of like exclusive. Th these guys well, play together well. Um, that amp is too bright for some of my other guitars. It's, it's kind of bright and, and, sh and uh, a little shrill. Um, but it handles this guitar well because it keeps it from, uh, from being too dark. And, and it was pretty dark, I know, but it's, it's at least, uh, I can get a little bite out of it. It can take off on its own, that's oh, for yeah. sure. Yeah. Well, Oliver, thank you so much for inviting us Thanks into your uh, clubhouse space. And uh, congrats on the new solo record, the first solo record of yours. Thanks. It's always smiling. It should be out on Friday, May 21st. Oliver, thank you again so much. Thank you. Everyone, check it out. Progress from your guitar. <laughs>